Okay, so my name is Julia Steinberger. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here. Uh, I hope we don't let you down as your first presenters. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Leeds. I work on the social side of climate science, social science, economic side of climate science, but I'm also a physics, physicist by training. And uh, so I know a bit about the climate physics, and I'll be telling you a bit more about that this evening. Um, what else should, should I? Oh, I should speak up a bit. Sorry about that, especially if there's motorcycle driving on. So, uh, so uh, yeah, so um, uh, I'm a lead author on the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, preparing the next assessment report. And so I'll be presenting you with some evidence or some information from the last assessment report as well. Um, so that's me. Yeah, um, I'm Kat Scott. I'm a researcher and a lecturer at the university. And I work more on the physical side of the climate, so trying to understand exactly what's going on in the atmosphere, what we're putting in there, how things react with each other, so a bit of chemistry as well, um, and looking at, at how that affects the climate. So yes, we, as Julia says, I hope we don't let you down as your, as your first set of commentators. Um, obviously, we're both from the university, so we're here to kind of try and give you some of the, the kind of background to, to climate and all the things that you've got to think about over the next few weeks. Um, so please feel free to ask us whatever you like and we'll try and answer the questions as best we can. Um, but I suppose you might have people coming in future weeks who are kind of more specialist in particular areas that you, you might be able to ask as well. So we'll, we'll try our best. Okay, so yes, so I'll get started. Um, we've got a few <laughs> props and, uh, and presentations I'll help with the props. and things. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> if you could prepare my slides. Oh yeah, you talk that one, that's great. Okay, seamless as you can see. <laughs> So I think if we come across a little bit, we just need to be in front of this. Can you let us know if we, if we, if we wander off to the wrong place? So the average temperature of the world has been rising for the past century and a half. And we know that this is happening because at the moment we have global networks of weather stations and, and thermometers that are actually measuring the temperature. But before that, we had to use things like um, ships that were sailing around the, the world's oceans, pulling up buckets of water from over the side of their vessels and, and measuring the, the temperature of the water. So we've got a record of the temperature back about um, 150, 180 years that we can use to, to make this assessment. And that's how we know that the temperature has definitely risen. Scientists are now certain that this rise has been due to the fact that we've put certain gases into the air that are having a particular impact. We think it's because of, of our human activities. So we know that the air around us is made up of all sorts of different gases. Um, these are individual molecules floating around. So the most obvious one that we think of is, is oxygen that we breathe in, but there are others. Some of them have particular characteristics that mean that when they're in the air, they actually act as a, as a, a warming. Um, and these are things like carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. So these are what we call greenhouse gases, collectively. And for the rest of the talk, we'll probably just talk about greenhouse gases in, in, uh, as, a, as a kind of collection, a collection of gases. So once they go into the air, they act... Oh, I'm going to use my... <laughs> so even though we can't see them, once they go into the air, they're acting like a kind of invisible blanket. And each year... Yeah, there we go. So each year... <laughs> We're adding more and more of these gases, and they're creating an ever thicker blanket around the planet. And the temperature rises. So it's all about the total amount that we've put in, really. That's what influences how warm it's got to, to, to this point so far. And the th the one of the problems with, with these gases is that they actually last quite a long time when they go into the air, so they don't just go into the air and then come out again. Some of them don't react with anything else, so they'll tend to hang around for tens of years and potentially hundreds of years. So that's why it's a real problem that we're, that we're putting them there. It's, it's important to remember, though, actually, we do need these greenhouse gases in the air. We need a small amount of them. If we didn't have them, the temperature on Earth would actually be far too cold for us to live here. So it'd be about minus 20 on average. So we actually do need some of them. So sometimes you might hear people saying, oh, we can't get rid of all the greenhouse gases because it would be too cold, and that is true. But we've kind of messed things up by, by adding a load of extra greenhouse gases and really elevating the, the concentrations. So although we are, human activity is emitting these gases into the air, 
actually only about half of the carbon dioxide we emit actually stays in the air. The rest of it's taken up by the oceans and by the forests. So they are kind of busily doing this job of taking some of the carbon out of the air. So some of the things that happen to the climate can affect the ability of, of either the forests or the oceans to actually do this. So where do these emissions come from? Well, we've got, thanks to Julia, we have a, a nice demonstration here of the sources of greenhouse gas emissions from society. So in yellow, these are the emissions from energy production so and yeah. heat. In blue, <laughs> in blue is uh, emissions from the transport sector. So when we fly places, when we drive cars that are emitting uh, pollution because they're burning petrol or diesel. Industry. In red is industry. So these are emissions that are actually coming from industrial processes. Green is agriculture. Green is agriculture. So this is the emission of mainly methane and nitrous oxides to do with um, farming processes. So methane is actually something that's emitted by, um, by the animals that, that are farmed, so cows and, and, and sheep, and so that's where a lot of that comes from. And there's also a, a portion here from the, the burning of forests um, as land is cleared. And, and the final one is buildings. So this is anything that's to do with the construction of buildings that's not kind of accounted for in these other sectors. And these make up the, the total emissions. So we can leave these here in the middle for the oh, discussion. I've forgotten what the first one was. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the generation of energy, so it's electricity and heating our homes uh, and buildings. So you can see that, um, and actually each, each one of these bricks represents about a gigaton of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so if you add them all up, you get to about 50 gigatons in total for the whole world. And this is pretty much how it breaks down. And I think... Uh -huh. Oh, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. oh. Gigaton measure into something that we can equate to yes. real life. Yes, a gigaton is a billion tons of gas. So how much is that in double decker buses? Double decker buses. <laughs> <laughs> well, about a, a, billion. Large, a large car is about a ton. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Y
definitely left the Holocene. We've definitely left this safe temperature band where we developed agriculture writing, um, you know, where we developed all the plants we eat, for instance, those plants did not exist before the last 12,000 years. And before those 12,000 years, um, what happened? So that's where I want to go to this plot, which, can you hold it up? Mm -hmm. Sorry, mm -hmm. there we go. So now we're gonna go to the second one down. And the second one down is very busy. So, uh, yeah, so you can see things. Sorry, I'm just going to try okay. to figure out where yeah. I can stand. <laughs> so this is the present, is sort of that red line. That's where we are now. Um, and again, you see time is going backwards here and forwards into the future this way. And so here you have this, this sort of cozy, stable time when we developed agriculture and everything else. And then you can see that the temperature drops, right? It sort of has these big drops, and those are ice ages. And you can see that time is sort of uh, not, it's not represented evenly along this plot. But what this plot tells us is that we had these ice ages before in the time of the planet. And um, so going back sort of uh, 300,000 years, K years mean thousand years, M years means millions of years. And then as we go back and sort of two million years ago, you see that we hit zero again. And that before that, the temperature of the planet was a lot warmer. And so one of the things this tells us about climate change and global warming is that we're actually going back in time in terms of the temperature of our planet. And what I've also overlaid on this plot is I've overlaid not just the time when we had agriculture and civilization, um, but also when Homo sapiens existed. So Homo sapiens, which is us, people we would recognize as just people who look like you and me, have been around since the past um, 250,000 years. And Homo genus, which is going further back uh, to people we may or may not really rec start recognizing as relatives, only appeared two million years ago, roughly. We're not completely sure. So what we're talking about is we're talking about, when we're talking about warming, what we're talking about is we're talking about going back to a time in the planet before humans ever existed. So these are temperature regimes and climates that we have never, as a species, experienced. Because we've only been around for times when the planet has been cooler, or in the case of ice age, is very cold. Um, and so uh, what, what's interesting to understand here is the trajectory that we're going into. So, so far, the planet has warmed by about one degree. And that's what you can see on the top plot, is that we've, we're warming by roughly one degree up here. Um, where we're going to in the future is what's really interesting because one degree already takes us out of the Holocene. We're already seeing climate impacts. We're already seeing uh, very dangerous things happen around the world. Where we're going depends entirely on what we do in the next few years. If we manage to keep things under control and really reduce emissions, we, sta we manage to stabilize this temperature around 1.5 degrees of warming. If we m aren't as successful, then we go to two degrees, three degrees, four degrees. On the trajectory we are now, as far as where we're heading in terms of our current emissions trend, we're headed for four degrees of m or more by the end of the century. What that means is it means that we would be going back, driving the climate at that rate of change, which is a completely unprecedented rate of change, completely cataclysmic. We would be driving the, t the temperature of the planet back to the level it was three million years ago before Homo anything ever existed in the next 10 years. So 10 years of our future corresponding to three million years going back into the past. And we'd be driving it even further back by the time you'd be in 2150, we'd be driving it back to um, roughly 50 million years ago, which is completely, um, which is, at that point, it's really not sure that humans can, can live at all well in that kind of environment, uh, let alone the plants that we depend on. So the, d the direction we're going in depends entirely on the actions we take now, and the level we of warming that we're able to maintain ourselves at depends on the actions we take now. Uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, which you might have heard of, is an international agreement where all countries exist agreed to efforts aiming at 1.5 degrees. Now this is a bit like when it's children at Christmas, they want to promise nice things. So they're like telling Santa Claus you've been really, really, really good. 
but you're not sure you're really going to be that good. So the countries also put into the Paris Agreement that they're really, their thing that they're really holding themselves to is not 1.5 degrees. That's their ultimate goal if they're really super amazing. They're really holding themselves to 2 degrees, staying below 2 degrees. Can but you what you mean by 1.5 and 2 degrees? So that's the warming above zero, above the pre-industrial era, uh, that would be reached by the end of the century. And the actions that the countries have committed to under the Paris Agreement would not even achieve 2 degrees. They wouldn't achieve, they wouldn't stay, keep us down to 1.5 degrees. They wouldn't keep us down to 2 degrees. They would actually take us somewhere around or upwards of 3 degrees. And those are the actions that countries say they're taking. The actions that they've really, what you actually really see them do is even less than that. And at the, in terms of the actions that they're really taking now, we're on a trajectory of um, uh, reaching four degrees or around four degrees or more. So the Paris Agreement is, not, is sort of a nice promise letter. It's not really being followed. And I think that you're, one of the things that you're doing is you're trying to think about how, how it can actually be put into action. Um, and maintain warming uh, at a lower level. Okay. okay. We're going to get to the next. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry? How do we know oh, what's going know? to happen in the future? Because we know how the climate responds to emissions, and we know what the models, the models tell us that we're going to be, have what, what warming corresponds to certain levels of emissions. I'm sorry? So what we're doing is we're every year we're wrapping this blanket further and further around the earth so we know how much that blanket is going to warm it up when we have all those layers on it. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> and so we use computer simulations to work that out and we basically have to take the information we have got so far about what's happened to the planet and how much we know it's gone up and the information we know about what we've done to it and what else is going on to kind of calibrate it and make sure it works and then we can use it to look at what happens in the future. Um, and that comes on to the information that's on the next piece of paper that you're getting, which is about the, um, the impacts, basically. So as Julia mentioned, the Paris Agreement is committing countries to limit warming to two degrees, but actually they've said they will try and limit warming to one and a half degrees. And you might think, well, what's the difference? You know, wh wh why does it matter which one it is? And so uh, what this next handout is showing you if, you're, if you turn to the side that's got the kind of red, the red um, circles at the top that are about extreme heat, we can see that when, when we talk about one and a half degrees and two degrees, this is the average temperature for the whole planet. So that's, we're saying at the moment things have warmed up by one degree on average, and we're trying to limit it to one and a half degrees on average. But that doesn't mean that it will always be just one and a half degrees warmer everywhere. It, it means that in some places it will be much, much warmer than that. And in some places it won't be as warm. So um, what this is indicating is that for um, situations where um, people are exposed to extreme heat, so basically heat waves, you can see that when the, if the planet is allowed to get two degrees warmer, that is going to be happening about 37%. Um, so 37% of the population, so all of the people in the world, would be exposed to, to heat waves. Whereas we can keep that to only 14% if we were to, to limit the amount of warming to one and a half degrees. So these things are already happening. So this isn't a case of we can stop all of the bad things from, from happening that could occur due to climate change. This is, can we try and avoid the worst impacts? And so when Julia was talking about at the end of the century, potentially reaching three degrees, four degrees. That's, you can imagine that just continues to go across on these charts. So things are bad at two degrees, they're worse at three degrees and four degrees. So we've started, scientists have started focusing really on these kind of temperature changes because we know it will be worse beyond that. And we're more interested in trying to limit the, limit the extent of the problem. So this handout, which you can all keep, um, summarizes some of the things that we think um, will happen. So I've mentioned the, the, the sheer rise in temperature, but there are other things. So climate change changes rainfall patterns and means that some parts of the world will get a lot wetter, some parts of the world will get a lot drier. And this is particularly important for parts of the world that grow a lot of crops. 
you can imagine that if they're experiencing higher temperatures and less rainfall, that really affects their ability to be able to, to grow crops. And people's lives depend on this, so that's, that's critical. The other things that, that are included on this table are things like species loss in the, in the green section. And we're looking at things like almost 20% of um, species that are losing the range in which they live at the moment. And the one I wanted to highlight, because I think it always shocks people quite a lot, is the, on the other side, um, the coral reefs in blue. Here, we've already damaged a lot of the world's coral reefs. So we're talking about, at two degrees, 99% of those coral reefs um, being damaged. And we're trying to, to at least save 20% of them by, by limiting warming to one and a half degrees. And just one final thing to say on the, the impacts of the warming is that there are a couple of things that we think might happen in the future, like the melting of ice in Greenland is an, is an example, where a series of events could, could happen that kind of trigger a lot of that to, to degrade and disintegrate at the same time. And we actually don't know exactly what temperature in the future would be required to kind of trigger that sort of event. But we think it's, you know, the more the temperature rises, the more likely things like that become. Uh, and we think the temperature at which something like, you know, real catastrophic changes to the Greenland ice sheet could occur is between one and a half and, and two degrees. So there really are incentives to try and keep the warming down to, to one and a half degrees. Okay. And I realise, so I'll be quick about the next part. So we're actually going to start with, if you go back to your previous handout, figure J6 is the last page, the, the, the last figure. And I just want to tell you something about the inequality. So climate change is not only a big problem, it's an extraordinary unequal problem. And I just want to tell you about a few of the ways in which it's unequal. So this was a study by Oxfam, but this is a relatively well-known uh, fact that shows that the top 10%, the richest 10%, and I'm sorry, it's not printed very clear, that's the top green band here, the, top, the richest 10% emit r half, roughly half, almost half of the greenhouse gases around the world. And so we have a problem where these emissions are the global emissions, but half of those are coming from the richest tenth of the population in the world. And then everybody else, you can see it gets extremely narrow, where the poorest 50% only emit roughly 10% of the world's greenhouse gases. So that's... Um, um, a really important thing to keep in mind. If we just go up one plot, you can see where sort of different countries are in terms of their carbon emissions, which is the main greenhouse gas per capita. And you can see the United Kingdom in red. So you can see that the United States is um, quite high. It's, yes, please, sorry. It's like, oh, per cap, sorry, per person. It's a, it's, we, we, it means capita literally means head in Latin, so it's per head. Sorry about that. So it's per ca carbon emissions per person. So you can see that the United States is quite high at 16, um, uh, 16 tons per person. Uh, Australia is quite high as well, uh, Canada as well. And then the United Kingdom, you know, it's doing quite a bit better than the United States. Um, and then you have other countries that are really very low, like India is the world's third largest emitter total as a country, but per person, the emissions are very low. Uh, less than a third of the emissions of, of the United Kingdom. Um, so you can see this inequality translating across the world. And the other thing, that aspect of inequality that I want to show, tell you about is um, figure J4, which is this, these funny maps. And I just want you to focus on the bottom one. I probably should have just printed out this one, which shows you some of the worst climate impacts are deadly heat deadly heat waves, and you can see that these will be happening across the tropics. So in the poorest parts of the world, you'll see the worst impacts. Okay, so we have two minutes left to give you our final point, which is about what we need to do. So that's really what we're all here to, to talk about. Yeah. We've given you the reasons why we need to do it. Um, so we're, we basically, if we accept the fact that we want to limit the warming to one and a half degrees, hopefully we've convinced you that there's enough reason to want to do that. Well, so what? What does that mean for these greenhouse gas emissions? Well. We need to be reducing them, obviously, but actually, and the detail of this doesn't really matter, but we need to reduce them, but actually we need to completely eliminate them. So we need to be getting down to zero emissions of, of all greenhouse gases by about 
the, in about 50 years' time, we need to have no emissions at all. And we need to be really reducing them very rapidly. So these coloured lines are basically just showing different pathways of, of emissions into the future. But the key thing to emphasise is that, as Julia said, if we keep emitting at the rate that we are emitting, we're looking at more like three or four degrees of warming. And we'll actually go through that one and a half degree threshold somewhere between 2030 and 2050. So we're reaching the point we don't want to be at quite soon. If we stopped emitting all of our greenhouse gas emissions tomorrow, the temperature would continue to rise a little bit because there's kind of inbuilt um, warming in the system from, from the fact that those greenhouse gases are there, but it wouldn't take us beyond one and a half degrees. So it really is up to us what happens for the rest of the century and for the, for the next few hundreds of years. Um, so we need to be aiming somewhere between completely reducing them immediately and continuing at the rate that we're at. And we think that really we want to be halving our emissions within the next decade or so. Um, and I think, so the one thing to say in addition to, to this breakdown of where the emissions come from is that we do have, as well as reducing emissions, we have another option um, available to us, which is to help the planet be able to take more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So at the moment, forests are, are doing that, but every time we cut them down or burn them, we're reducing the planet's capacity to, to take carbon dioxide out of the air. So one thing we can do is re eliminate deforestation and reforest the areas of the world that we have, we have deforested. And I'll stop there because Julia has more to say. Or maybe I'm going to be stopped by Pete. You've got like 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 30 Sorry. seconds, that's easy. So um, in terms of the, uh, I just wanted to say a few things about not just uh, technical transformation, but also about social and economic transformation. Um, the cl the cl climate change is a problem that came from the Industrial Revolution and the expansion of certain industries and technologies associated with certain industries and economic growth. And one of the things we really need to think about, and that's one of your jobs as well, to open up that space to think about moving away from certain technologies, certain industries, and certain ways that the economy has been functioning just by sort of expanding profits and expanding um, uh, these fossil fuels, which are still growing. So these emissions are still growing year on year. And that's one of the things to think about is what do we really need to change in how we work and function and live? Okay. Okay. Sorry. Can we say a big